Hi class and welcome to this final screencast in our unit on evolution. Very sad that we're finishing up this unit. It's my favorite unit, but maybe you're about ready to move on to another topic. So we've talked a lot about evolution of life, evidence for evolution, how it happens, but we haven't really answered the question of, well, how did all of this life that's been evolving for billions of years, how did it all begin? So this week, next couple weeks, we're going to try to attempt to answer and investigate that question. So, enduring understanding, the origin of living systems is, is explained by natural processes. Now, one thing that we really have to keep in mind is that we don't know for sure, obviously, but what we're going to look at are various hypotheses for how it happened, and all of these hypotheses are natural processes that could have happened. So let's just start from the very beginning. Let's discuss when did all this happen. Well, the early Earth formed approximately 4.6 billion years ago, but it was really too hostile for life until about 3.9 billion years ago. And the early, earliest fossil evidence is from 3.5 billion years ago. So that's sort of the key date there that we think life first began because of the fossils. So taken together, all of this gives us a plausible range for when the origin of life could have occurred. And again, nobody knows for sure. Um, so there are several hypotheses about it, and all of these hypotheses are supported by geological, physical, and chemical evidence or actual experiments. And so I'm going to just sort of briefly touch on the surface of these, and then in class we're going to do some further investigations. We're going to do a lab um, to really look and analyze these various hypotheses. So could organic compounds have been made abiotically on the early Earth? So organic means carbon-containing. All life on Earth is a carbon-based life form. Abiotically simply means non-living. Bio means life. A means not. So there was, you know, some scientists have asked this question and done experiments on it. Could we have gotten organic things from non-organic things, from non-living things? Could that have happened? So in 1953, the scientist Stanley Miller decided to test this hypothesis by recreating Earth's early atmosphere and using an electrical discharge that simulated lightning. So what did that early atmosphere look like? Well, it wasn't very nice. No oxygen, but there was a lot of energy. Um, and so he, he used that electrical discharge to give that system some energy. And what he found was that amino acids and other organic compounds were actually created. Not a lot, but it was something. This showed that from this abiotic mess of gas and, and energy, we could get organic compounds. That was huge. And so this is now called this primitive soup of amino acids and other organic compounds. Here is a uh, just sort of an overview of Stanley Miller. This is Stanley Miller over here um, and his experiment. So here we have just this early abiotic atmosphere of early Earth, electrical discharge, just some, some gases. Um, he put in an electrical spark, and then he condensed it, and what did he get out of it? Well, he got out this, uh, through this primitive, uh, sorry, right here, he got out this primitive soup, soup of amino acids and other organic compounds. That's one hypothesis, but like I said, there are several. So how else could life have come about? Did it happen near deep sea vents? A lot of energy there, a lot of elements. Maybe, maybe volcanoes had something to do with it. Could it have come from space? Meteorites. Um, we have analyzed meteorites, and we have seen structures that maybe resemble a life form. That, and this was discovered in Antarctica. So regardless, okay, we've got these various hypotheses. Uh, somehow, some organic compounds were created, and then what happened next? Well, what happened next was these organic compounds like amino acids, nucleotides, etc., these building blocks, they then have to be assembled together to form polymers. So these are just basically stretches of many amino acids or many nucleotides. And here's an example of a very basic polymer. Well, the question is, how did this happen? How did we go from building blocks to polymers? Um, it could have just happened in this primitive soup model. It could have happened on its own. Or some scientists hypothesize uh, that these amino acid polymers were actually created by clay, sand, or rock. That there was something, some enzyme or something in that rock that helped catalyze the reaction from building block to polymer. And again, we don't know for sure. So then we have a polymer. So we've got a building block, we've got polymer, and now we have to ask how do we get to actual life, a living life form? 
Well, let's go back to what is life. Life is partly defined by two properties. Accurate replication, because that genetic information uh, has to be passed on to the next generation, and basic metabolism. Life has to be able to survive and get energy and nutrients and use those energy and nutrients. So the hypothesis for the formation of these protobionts, okay, proto just sort of means early, bionts mean living, so these are just very early life forms, um, meets these conditions of metabolism and replication because protobionts can spontaneously form from abiotic compounds and they're surrounded by a membrane, and we call this a liposome. And so these liposomes can actually replicate and perform simple metabolism. So let me show you a real quick picture. This is a simple liposome. It's just made up of a, of a phospholipid bilayer. These are phospholipids. It's a bilayer. This can form spontaneously. It, it makes an inside and an outside, and therefore things can come in and things can go out. So that's simple metabolism. Um, and then we're going to take a look at the replication part right now. So protobionts comes after polymers. So now we're going to turn these protobionts into actual life when they start to pick up nucleic acids. So they have to be able to replicate, store, and transfer this genetic information. And we believe well, the big hypothesis is that that nucleic acid was RNA. We call it an RNA world. Um, and why do we believe that it was RNA and not DNA that was the first genetic information? Well, there are several reasons. Uh, first, RNA has multiple functions. It can be a ribozyme, which is just simply um, an RNA enzyme, so it performs catalysis. It can form a huge variety of 3D shapes because it's single-stranded, so it can look like this, it can look like this, and obviously it stores information. So we, one hypothesis is that these protobiont, protobionts picked up this RNA from the surrounding environment and then was able to store information, replicate, and transfer that information. All right, so we went from building block to polymer uh, to protobiont, and now we're beginning to have some actual life. So 2 to 3.5 billion years ago, we have these protobionts evolve into actual autotrophic cells and heterotrophic cells. Now these first cells are prokaryotes. So remember from a few years ago learning about prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. Prokaryotes are just very simple. They don't have a nucleus and they don't have membrane bound organelles. They're like bacteria. Um, so the first life forms were bacteria. And we have this oxygen revolution happen because of some prokaryotic cyanobacteria. These guys were awesome. They were able to perform photosynthesis. And you know what a product of photosynthesis is? It's oxygen. So the Earth owes its early oxygen atmosphere to cyanobacteria. And this was huge. This allowed diversification of other life forms who were able to use and thrive on oxygen. Then we have this bacteria and prokaryotes evolve into eukaryotes about 2.1 billion years ago. However, we're still single-celled, uh, but we are eukaryotic with the nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. And we have something called the endosymbiosis theory, um, which explains the sort of origin of our organelles of mitochondria and the plant organelle chloroplasts. And this says that at one time, these tiny organelles were actually small prokaryotes that lived on their own. And there's multiple pieces of evidence for this uh, that you're going to find in your book, and that's one of the questions that I'll ask you at the end. But these small prokaryotes were taken up by a large cell as a part of endosymbiosis because it benefited both of them. It benefited that small prokaryote, and it benefited the larger eukaryote. And over time, um, these just simply became cellular organelles. And so we'll revisit this more later in Chapter 6 when we study cells. So here's a eukaryotic cell, and here is the mitochondria right here, and so we believe that this was, at one time, its own prokaryotic cell. So finally, we have eukaryotes evolve into multicellular eukaryotes about 1.5 billion years ago, and animals appeared during the Cambrian explosion about 700 million years ago. So these are your earliest animal life forms, sponges, cnidarians, etc. 500 billion years ago, we move on to land. Up until this point, we're still in the water, um, but now we've got plants, fungi, early animals colonizing land. So let's put it all together. How do we know all of this? Well, we use multiple lines of evidence, just like any good scientist should. So we've got molecular evidence from um, 
from amino acids, we've got genetic evidence from DNA and RNA. And we're using this evidence from both current to extant, so that means current uh, organisms and extinct organisms. And comparing all of this information, just like you did in your lab, tells us that all of these organism, organisms did in fact share an ancestral life form, a common origin of life from that very first organic compound in that primitive soup all the way to the polymer and the protobiont and the prokaryote. We all came from that little prokaryote. Um, why do we know this? Because we've got a common molecular building block even with the simplest prokaryotes. We share this triplet code. We've got a common genetic code of the four nucleotides, C, T, G, and A. We've got the same uh, amino acid code. It's just amazing when you really put it all together how alike we are. Um, and because of all of this common information, scientists have organized all of life into a tree of life with three domains. And the three domains are this, and this is very important, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Now these two are prokaryotic, and obviously eukaryotes are eukaryotic. But what do you notice? This is really important down here. This is the common ancestor, the common origin to all of life. We share at least a little bit with this bacteria and with these archaea and with other eukaryotes. It really is amazing. So universal ancestor at some point gave rise to bacteria and then it split off and then this further split off into archaea and eukaryotes. So what well, the point I want to make here really is that eukaryotes, we're eukaryotes, we are actually more similar to archaea and archaea are prokaryotes that live in very extreme environments. They live in deep sea thermal vents um, they like a high salt or high heat. Um, we're more similar to them than we actually are to bacteria that live all among us on our body uh, every day. So this is the three domains and the tree of life, putting it all together that yes, we have a universal ancestor. So now you just have some homework questions. Uh, State Miller's hypothesis in his classic experiment. Um, Miller also conducted an experiment stimulating a volcanic eruption. In 2008, scientists reanalyzed this and found more than 20 amino acids were produced at, in compared to his classic experiment that I showed you. Explain how so many more could have been produced in the volcanic um, eruption experiment. And lastly, the first appearance of free oxygen in the atmosphere likely triggered a massive wave of extinctions among the prokaryotes of the time. Why do you think that is? So bring your video notes and your uh, answers to these questions into class.